All right, welcome, Refuge. You guys ready for a time of worship? Woo! It's going to be all worship music tonight. Why don't you guys go ahead and stand to your feet if you're done with your dinner? If not, feel free to um, keep sitting. But we're so excited that you are here. If you're joining us live, if you're on your way, um, watching us online, or if you're at home watching online, we just pray that tonight would be a blessing to you. Let's go ahead and pray and welcome the Lord in this time of worship. God, we just thank you so much for um, who you are and the work that you have done all summer long here at Resonance. And we pray that um, our worship tonight would be a blessing to you. And as the kids are being dismissed in behind the bouncy house and going off to their time and the youth heading back to the back parking lot and all the things going on this evening, that you would be present amongst it. We thank you for this and we just give you honor and praise.
open up. And it's so good to see you guys tonight. Let's keep singing together this evening. songs that are inviting you into this place, Lord. We 
just want to pause, Lord, this evening and acknowledge you as our Lord. And God, this is a public declaration. We're outside, God, because we love our community. And we know the love that you have for us and for them. And so would you work in this place, Lord, in this parking lot, God, through these songs that we sing, through the word that we're going to hear from in a moment, God. You're so good to us, Lord. And so we just give you that, that space to move, God. We ask that you would do that in a way that only you can, Jesus. So we're excited to see, God, what it is that you have in store for us tonight. We worship you, Lord. Let's sing this together. There's nothing worth more. And there's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living. Your presence, Lord. Yes, I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, of where my heart becomes free, oh, when my shame is undone. In Your presence. Together sing Holy Spirit. We're singing Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come and flood this place and fill the atmosphere. For your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare, cause you're our living Lord. You are. Oh, it's your presence, Lord. Oh, I've tasted God. And I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Oh, in your presence, Lord Sing Holy Spirit Sing in Holy Spirit You are welcome Come flood
How? 
rock, oh the rock, oh the fail us, even when we fail and fall, Lord, you remain faithful still. So Lord, tonight we just lift our voice and praise and honor the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who loves us deeply and unconditionally. Lord, anyone here tonight that would doubt your love for them, or would you open their eyes to see how deep your love, how wide your love, how great your love is. Lord, thank you for your presence tonight. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be here together because of you. May you be honored in our gathering, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give these guys a hand. Awesome. Awesome time of worship. Um, the good news is they're not done. You guys can have a seat for a second, though. Uh, well, welcome once again um, to Refuge, to um, the second to last residents outside the third last residence. I know we have some visitors from out of town. If you are visiting out of town, can we just give a little wave? Welcome. I know there's some from Oregon, from Texas. I see you. Shout out anywhere else. You said something. I couldn't hear you, but I believe you. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Um, I just want to take a note to say a couple of things, a couple of announcements here. Um, if you have kids and you have not yet checked them into kids ministry, you can do that um, behind the bouncy house. Um, they're going to have a great time tonight. Um, also, our vendors, our fantastic vendors, are going to be open a little bit after um, our close tonight, so take advantage of that afterwards. Um, and then also, that's when you can get one of these, these super cool residence t-shirts with the collectible band lineup on the back. That's right. If you want to get one of those before you miss your chance. Um, um, also, uh, while you were shopping at the vendors, one of you might have lost something very precious to you. When I say precious, some of you know what I mean. So check your hands, make sure you're not missing a ring. And if you are, come see me, because I'm holding on to that for you. Um, I will not take it to Mordor. I will hold on to it, um, unless I find Frodo, and then off limits. He's getting it. Anyway, so that's happening. Um, <laughs> or not, and it will go to the church office if, um, if someone doesn't pick that up tonight. A uh, lot's going on here at Refuge, including a lot of stuff coming up for the men of Refuge. That's right, you have a barbecue tomorrow night right here to my left, your right, in our cafe. Um, and in a couple of Saturdays, is an all-day event you don't want to miss out on as well. You can find all that info at our web at our website, refugefamily.com. Um, also, follow us on social media. Um, you'll get helpful tips like if you were here last Wednesday, you found out on social media, yes, despite the rain, we are still having resonance. So good alerts like that. Um, and, but make sure the big thing that you want to... Um, take note of and share with your, your friends and family is three weeks from today, our very last Resonance concert is with Alexander Papas. He's probably on your playlist. He's definitely on the radio station you're listening to. He's from the band Hillsong Young and Free, and we are just so excited to have that last concert here at Resonance, so make plans to be here for that. It's non-ticketed, but you might want to get here a little bit early. Um, just let your boss know now. You might need to get off a little bit before 
And then two, two weeks from today, did I say three? Thank you, thank you, Irv. He not only does parking, he also helps me out, keeps me on track, I appreciate that. So two weeks from today. Um, and then, yeah. And I think to get started with that too, um, something you might want to take um, advantage of is we have a Refuge Spotify playlist that this guy over here, Jesse, who loves our worship leader, Jesse, we so appreciate him and the rotation of people that um, he brings along each week on Sundays and on Wednesdays um, as part of the worship band here. And so we, he has put together a Spotify playlist. And so if you're like, oh, I want to keep in touch with all the new songs and, and just be ready, um, I highly recommend to look that up. I just did to make sure that I could help you find it. It's Refuge HB Worship Playlist. Refuge HB Worship Playlist. If you search that, you will have no trouble finding that. Um, speaking of the worship team tonight, you may notice someone that's not usually here. How many of you know Scott Cunningham? You're familiar with him. He's been around um, the Orange County um, worship scene for a while, Calvary Costa Mesa and otherwise. Otherwise, he has doing something new that's really cool. Since I first heard about it like two minutes ago, um, well, probably more like 20 minutes ago, I looked it up and I couldn't think of a better fit. It's called Likewise Ministries, and he is pouring into and connecting with the current and next generation of worship leaders. Doesn't that sound like a great fit? Um, we're so excited about that. So he's going to talk a little bit more about that. And please, when you do, um, let them let us all know how we can support that ministry as well. Um, Pastor Bill is going to be speaking tonight in a little bit. Um, but before that happens, why don't we go ahead and stand wave hello to the helicopter and also greet one another and why don't you just turn to one another and say this is summer but my favorite season is blank and then share why and one of the nicest people that you'll meet in the refuge hallways, but also all of you guys are always nice too, so. Hey, as we um, continue doing a few worship songs, I wanted to invite Scott to talk a little bit about um, Likewise Worship and what they're doing. Um, this has been a huge blessing to me personally uh, because as he's gonna explain, Likewise is a ministry that is devoted and made for worship leaders and people in a worship team. And, um, it can be a little bit of a crazy job sometimes, right? And uh, ministry can have its ups and downs, and their ministry is solely focused on providing health and just support and love and, and a shoulder to cry on and a high five when we're celebrating. And so Scott, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just talking a little bit about Likewise and kind of how the Lord brought you there, what you guys are doing. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Awesome, how are you guys doing tonight? Great, awesome. So it's a blessing to be with you, and I just absolutely love Pastor Bill. He's been such a big influence on my life over the years, and I uh, ran a school of worship for about 20 years, and Bill would teach it at all the time, and it was just such a sweet class every time Bill would teach. But um, in this next season of life for me, I, I felt really, really called to uh, pour into the next generation of young worship leaders, and a big part of that vision came from Isaiah 58, where shall lay the foundation of the next generation. The Lord just really applied that to my life. Um, we were just singing that song, Firm Foundation, and in that line there that says, he's gonna be faithful through generations. And that always hits me in a special way, like one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. And God is always on the move, like working from generation to generation. You think about your generation and how God uh, saved you and rescued you and some of the songs that maybe were the soundtrack of that season of your life I, we could probably you know name a few of those and it just takes you back to what the Lord did in your life in that season and we just you know being able to sing our praise and have songs that are sung that point us to the Lord and remind us of his faithfulness and goodness and kindness to us are so so valuable so um, we just have a real heart to see that next generation encouraged and built up 
Um, so this new season, I joined a nonprofit called Likewise Worship, where we, it's kind of preventative and restorative ministry for worship leaders. We have once a month gatherings. I do a lot of one-on-one discipleship, mentoring through the week. And then we do like a yearly retreat. So we just, it's a, it's a ministry focused on caring for the local worship leader who's in the trenches in frontline ministry week in and week out. And uh, guys like Jesse are just a, such a blessing. And, um, and you see God working in their life in this generation that's ministering to us. And it's such a beautiful thing. So we get a chance to pour into them. And kind of our tagline is really healthy leaders, humble worship, and one church. We're just about, there's, there's one church, right? We're all a part of God's big, beautiful, diverse church. So, um, yeah, if you want to find out more information, you can look up likewiseworship.com. And um, we're, a, we're a donor-supported ministry, and it's just a beautiful thing to see the Lord provide in that way. But excited to be with you here tonight and, and sing together and worship Jesus together. So let's continue that. darkness now is ended in the kingdom of light in the kingdom of light forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my life you reign above it all you reign above it all you reign above it all over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. On the cross, the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, hear an anthem arise. Jesus, you're alive. Oh, you reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher. Hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above the Lord. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. You're seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Seated alone in glory. The throne of the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. The seated alone in glory. The throne of the highest praise. You reign above it all. Let's sing it together. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe.
reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. wrote this simple song in England a few years back, um, serving at an outreach called Creation Fest. It's a real simple song called Breathe on Us, and it's a chance for us just to pray in that biblical prayer that the Lord would fill us with His Holy Spirit. So let's sing it together tonight. So meet me in the solitary. Meet me in the ordinary. Meet me in the sanctuary. Make my heart your home. Meet me in the solitary. Meet me in the ordinary. sanctuary make my heart your home for I want the fullness of your love I want the treasure of your peace and I want the fullness of your surrounding me so meet me in the solitary so meet me in the solitary meet me in the ordinary meet me in the sanctuary make my I want the fullness of your love. I want the treasure of your peace. I want the fullness of
want the fullness. Lord, we want the fullness of your love. We want the treasure of your peace. We want the fullness of God, tonight as we get to hear from your word now, Lord, as we get to step into, man, your presence, Lord, knowing that you're here with us because we're gathered, God, and we want to see you speak and move, Lord, in our lives, and so that's, that's what we're expecting for, Lord. God, I thank you through the way that you've already prepared our hearts, God, through these songs. Lord, we do, we want the fullness of your love in this, in this parking lot tonight, God fullness of your love in our hearts, God, as we leave this place in a few minutes and we go and interact with our families and our coworkers and our friends, Lord. Would people see us not only full of your spirit, but full of your joy, the grace that you give, God? Would we be reflections of who you are, God? And so fill us now as we hear from you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Hey, would you guys stay here and just keep playing like that for a minute? Would you guys just keep playing that for a minute? Um, I went to look for a verse that I, I knew I wanted to share tonight um, as we pray for Maui and as we lift up that, uh, that broken island right now. And uh, how many of you have been praying for them? How many of you have shed tears for those people? And, um, and I was looking for this verse and I thought, well, where is that one? How many of you know all kinds of Bible that you don't know where to find it? It's in there, but you don't know where to find it. And it was, it was just a couple of verses after a different uh, uh, verse that I had marked for tonight. But listen to this. It's Isaiah 61. It's quoted, some of this is quoted in Luke chapter 4. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim the captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Zion, listen, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. A joyous blessing instead of mourning. Festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted. <laughs> or great banyan trees maybe for his own glory they will rebuild the ancient ruins repairing cities destroyed long ago and they will revive them though they have been deserted for many generations god loves to take broken stuff doesn't he and make a treasure out of it he loves that he loves that and god we pray tonight for our friends and some of us lord our family and certainly many of our brothers and sisters in jesus who, who live in Maui and, and in those regions that have just been devastated, Father, from these fires. And we pray that a testimony of your greatness will rise out of these ashes in Jesus' name, Lord. Father, we pray for families that are grieving right now over the loss of their loved ones and for those that they're still missing and unidentified. Oh, God, would you just give them grace tonight? And Lord, would you raise up an army of your people? to just swoop in there and take part in the rebuilding and the comforting, Lord, of those in this time of loss. And Lord, as we even go into your word tonight to, to see how you did that with one woman, Lord, would you do it again and again and again and again and again? We love you, Lord, and we love the way that you rebuild the broken. And thank you for doing that in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, beauty for ashes for you.
I need help. You already knew that, didn't you? <laughs> I, I do. Here, here. This is yours. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, I need some help. I need ten fast people to help me pass out some stuff. One, come on up. Come on up, Tim. Others. One, two, three. Jump down there. And grab one of these buckets. They're the small buckets, but they're full, and I hope I've got enough in there. They're just broken pieces of shell. And so just run around through the, the congregation and pass out as many as you have. And if you didn't get one, I'll make sure that you, you get one. How, how many of you have... Um, uh, they're all gone. Sorry, Evan. Good. Um, but how many of you have too much stuff at home? Come on, come on. How many of you have stuff you haven't touched in years in your home? There, there you go. Me too. Um, good stuff. Maybe it's junk. I don't, I don't know what it is, but me too. And uh, I keep gathering it. I don't know what's wrong with me. More stuff that I'm not touching and not using, but, but I keep on gathering it. And it just keeps piling up. And, in, and, I'm, and I'm about to get serious about dealing with it. Do you hear that? About to get serious? Did you hear a little bit of a hesitation in that? You know, you know why there's a hesitation? Because it's hard to do that. It's hard to get rid of stuff that you had a connection with. And so I'm trying to clear the clutter away in my study at home. How many of you remember the cross in the courtyard here? From where I'm standing right now, I can see the, the beautiful uh, stained glass in the middle of it, which is made out of broken glass shining in the night. And um, so when we were making that, let me see the hands of those that helped make that. Some of you that put your hands into a piece or more, honey, your hands are all over those pieces of, yeah. Now, honey, by the way, is my wife. Um, her name is Joy, but it's Honey Joy. Um, but uh, remember that? And, and I went out and I gathered over 3,000 pieces of broken shell off of the beach to put into that cross. And I overestimated by about 2,000 pieces. I just didn't know how many it would take to, to fill that up over there. And so I, I brought a few hundred to pass out to you because you just need some of my junk. And I'm happy to share my junk with you guys too. But uh, thank you guys for passing those out. Let's hear it for the guys, the runners. They, they did it quickly. Now hold on to that shell, okay? Because as you, if you know me, that might come up again in the message tonight. But I want you to open your Bibles with me to John chapter 4. And I would say Luke chapter 4, but don't worry about that. We just read that same passage from um, Isaiah 61, where it originally came from. So I hope you're catching the theme in all of these messages. And, and the theme really goes back to Isaiah 61. It goes back to Luke chapter 4, when Jesus stood up in that that uh, synagogue in, uh, in Nazareth, that, the town where he'd been raised, and, and he stood up as a respected adult man now. And they handed him the, the scroll of Isaiah when he showed up for Shabbat services, most likely is when he was there. They handed it to him and trusted him to read a passage, and he might have started with the passage that the Torah was open to, or that the, the prophets were open to, the scroll of Isaiah. He might have started with that, but he moved on to another passage as well, so he could get another item in what he said to the people. But he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and let me condense this. He said, because he's anointed me to heal and forgive and restore broken people, busted up people. He said, this is why I've come. The only reason that I'm here is to reach out and, and help broken people and to bring, oh, I wish he would have quoted this in that synagogue that day, to bring beauty for ashes. Because that metaphor, all of us understand that metaphor, don't we? How, how many of you would look back at a time in your life where you just saw all your hopes go up in smoke? That beauty that God has maybe brought already out of the ashes of that moment. But, but, but Jesus made it clear that he was coming in to touch individuals. And so we've called this study through, all through the summer. Our focus has been one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. Because you need to remember, Jesus wasn't just about the multitude. In every multitude, he saw every single individual. And he knew what was broken. He knew what was burnt in them. He knew what had been shredded, what hopes had been shredded. And he knows that about you. 
I would imagine most of you here are lovers of Jesus. If you're a lover of Jesus, give out a shout for him. I kind of thought there was few of you here tonight. But, but we, we, we love the multitudes. And you know, the multitudes to us, they, they vow, especially for preachers. You get a multitude, you feel like, oh, I'm validated. Oh, I mean something. We drew a whole bunch of people. It's exciting. It feels like a party. A multitude feels like a party. Uh, you can get a lot of stuff done if you've got a multitude of people. And I am praying that some of you will join together with teams that are heading over to Maui. Just talked to Peter Wright um, this afternoon. And he was talking to someone from Calvary Chapel, La Habra. And they already have a team over there assessing um, what they're going to be helping with. And we're hopefully going to be joining up with them with their direct connections in Maui. So how many of you would be interested in joining a, a recovery team and maybe a rebuilding team? Uh, 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 okay, I see several hands. That's, that's perfect. And so we'll tell you more about that as, as that time comes up. But, but Jesus didn't just come for the multitude, and we know that. There's nothing new to you. But Jesus came for the one, the one just like you. Jesus seems more or at least just as focused on the one as he was the huge multitude of people. And, and that's why I, I, I love taking the summer to focus on that. You are the one that is the focus of his love. And so is the person sitting next to you and behind you. And, and the guy with the microphone shouting at you tonight. We're the focus of his love. One-on-one -on -one he loves us personally and perfectly. But with the multitude, sure, he gave them his time. And he poured out truth to them as, as they gathered. And he did miracles. He did the miracles, what? One-on-one, -on -one, one by one. But he gave them his attention. He gave them his time. He gave them his power. He reached out to them and he gave them his love. Now, I don't think there was any question if you met Jesus... As he walked away, you would get the impression, I think he likes me. Or maybe you'd be more accurate to say, I think he loves me. Maybe if you, if you were a Pharisee that he was rebuking, maybe in the privacy of your own home at night, maybe you got that message too. He loved me enough to correct me. He loves us. These stories fill up the New Testament. And, and, I, and I hope and I pray that you know that Jesus cares as much for each one of you as he did about all those that we've been studying all this summer long. He cares about you and your pain. He cares about your loneliness. He cares about your failures. You got any failures? He cares about your addictions and your fears, and he's ready to break through on those things, even tonight. There's somebody here tonight that needs to let go of something that has dominated your life and you don't even know how to let go of it anymore. You keep falling back to it again and again and he wants to set you free from that tonight. He comes for the one that's here tonight. Our, our true story tonight is one broken hearted woman who has had five long stories that she could tell us of her brokenness and her failure. So if you're open to John chapter 4, I want to read it to you. This, this is early in Jesus' ministry. The Gospel of John, it's in the early chapters, obviously, but Jesus, he's definitely rolling now. There, there's no question about it. He is rolling. In chapter 1 of John, you've got the launch. Here he comes. God in flesh is here among us. He really is God in flesh, even if the people in the park with the magazines tell you otherwise. He, he really was God in the flesh. You met him, you'd, you'd know exactly what the Father was like. We saw in chapter 1, John the Baptist. We saw him beginning to, to gather his followers, and then Jesus is gathering his followers. In chapter 2, Jesus does this crazy miracle, a totally unnecessary miracle. I'm sorry you're out of wine It's your wedding. Maybe you need a little more water than you need wine. But he multiply, he, he, he changes water into wine. He didn't need to do that. And, and scholars argue over why would he do that? But he did it. And he made a whole bunch of people at that wedding very, very happy. You see him clearing the temple of hypocrisy and getting angry. How many of you are at least a little bit comforted that sometimes in the Bible you see an angry Jesus? Let me say this. He's angry for the right reasons. <laughs> He might not get angry over the things that you and I get angry about. 
But he gets angry when the father is misrepresented. In chapter 3, oh man, Nicodemus. And I think, Jeff, you're going to be doing Nicodemus, right? In, inside with the concert in a couple of weeks. But in, also in chapter 3, John is there rejoicing over Jesus when he hears that his popularity is through the roof. It, it, it's exploding. It is the beginning of the Jesus what? Movement. And you would have loved that Jesus movement. Because Jesus was coming for the common people. Let me, let me restate that. For the common person. Because the people are made out of individual persons. He loved the common person, the broken person, the outcast person, and even the wicked person. And all of them in that story, they're finding hope. Now at this point in, in John chapter 4, follow along with me. Let me read a little bit. I promised you I'd do that, so I better get started. But it says this, Jesus knew that the Pharisees, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that he, Jesus, was baptizing and making more disciples than John. He knew that his popularity now was eclipsing John's, and John's popularity was a big problem to the Pharisees because he was so un -Pharisee like He was so unorthodox. And he seems just a little bit out there at times, doesn't he? And of the stuff that he eats, come on, bugs? Come on, John, bugs, why? They're not bad if you dip them in honey, I hear. But it says that, that they knew, the Pharisees knew that Jesus was making more disciples than John did, though Jesus himself didn't baptize, his disciples did that. So he, Jesus, left Judea and returned to Galilee. And he, verse 4, he had to go through Samaria. Let me, let me pause there. No Jew had to go through Samaria. Samaria was like polluted ground to them, culturally and spiritually. There's long-standing conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans. And that's why Jesus will make a hero out of Samaritans a couple of times in his stories. The, the, the story of the great Samaritan. I know the heading in your Bible says it was a good Samaritan. doesn't say that in the text. Scratch out good, put down great or amazing Samaritan. So Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. No Jew had to, but he had a good reason to go through Samaria. One, one translation says he needed to. The Berean translation, which I've never read, I just saw it, it quoted online today. The Berean translation says it was necessary. Why? Everybody say, because of her. Because of her. Let's meet her. So he left. And he went through Galilee. Then he came through Samaria on the way. And eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And, and, Je and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about new time. And he's not play acting. He's tired. If you hike with me in Israel, this next, uh, what is it, Shaddy? April or March? I... I is it April? Yeah. If, if you walk with me in Israel, you're going to get tired and you're going to look for a well to sit down by, more like a water fountain or a Starbucks. But he was tired from his long walk, sat wearily beside the, the well about noon time, and soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Okay, many, how many of you have heard this story preached on before? Probably many times. Women did not come out at noon time to draw water. You came out in the cool of the day. There's two cools of the day. You're in one of them right now, the cool of the evening. But if you go out in the cool of the morning before the sun is up and hot, you got the whole day to get back home. If you go out in the cool of the night, you might be walking home in the dark. But, but she, she should have come out when all the other women came out, and you'll find out why she didn't come out. Because most of the women in the, in the city, if not all of them in the town of Sychar, they knew her. They knew her story. And they were guarding their husbands, maybe when she was around. But it says, she came out at noon, high noon, all by herself, just her and Jesus. She came to draw water, and Jesus said, please give me a drink. I love the please in there, don't you? He didn't demand of her. He said, just please, could I have a drink of water? 
And he was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. And I'm sure he sent them because they might have been in the way in this encounter if they'd been hovering around as Jesus spoke to a Samaritan woman. The woman, this says verse 9, was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. They ignore them as they walk by. They have, what's the word? There's a word, epithet, something like that. It's like bad sayings for Samaritans. And they would, I don't know if they'd curse them out like, like you talk about cussing someone out, but they would ignore them and they would marginalize them. They were outcasts to them. They have nothing to do with them. And so she said to Jesus, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? She's surprised. And I think you, you get it from the beginning of the story to the end. This lady is what we called in Australia, might, she's just a little bit cheeky, if you know what I mean. She's just, she's answering back and she's getting a little bit sarcastic with Jesus. Why are you asking me for a drink? My, meanwhile, Jesus is thirsty and he wants a drink. And Jesus said to her, if, if you only knew the gift, of, the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. So he's come back on her cheekiness. I got better water than you got to give. And she says, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. And she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave you this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water, which I still wish you'd give me a drink. Could you please pass the water over? Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, including Jesus. But those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. Now, how many of you could say amen? You've had a drink, haven't you? Of the living water. And it quenches that deepest thirst of all. You know what that thirst is? It's a thirst for peace. It's a thirst for hope. It's a thirst for Jesus. It's a thirst for a relationship with God. And when you drink that water, what does it say? You're satisfied. You're satisfied. And I, I, I love what Jesus would say in another passage. He said, that water, you take a drink of this water, and it will become in you more water than you need. It will become in you a river of living water flowing out to what? Other people. You'll be a source of refreshment for other people. Doing what? Inviting them to the same well that you came to. He said, it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, bringing them or giving them eternal life, never thirsty again. And she says, please, sir, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water in the middle of the day to avoid all those other women in the town that hate me. It didn't really say all that, but that's why she's out there at that time. And Jesus said, you're right. No, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. Verse 16, and Jesus says to her, go get your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. Said, look, look at my ring. Look at, look at my hand. I got no, no wedding ring. I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, "Whoo! no kidding you don't. No, I'm sorry. He said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Everybody go, oh boy. Did he read her story or what? Why did Jesus need to go through Samaria for this lady? For this broken hearted lady? With five stories that would be too long for her to tell. How she met them and how the marriage turned out and how it got broken and why he left or she left, and why he divorced her. He said, you've spoken the truth. You had all those husbands, and the one you're with now, you're just, as we used to say, shacking up with him. And she said to him, she did what we do. Sometimes when we get caught, we change the subject, don't we? Listen to what she said. Sir, you must be a prophet. So enough about me. 
So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while we Samaritans claim that it is here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? What does that have to do with the conversation about husbands? Nothing. That's the point. Let's change the subject. This is uncomfortable. How could you know that? I don't care how you knew that. I don't want to talk about that. He touched the most painful part of her life, and he's not done touching it. He's going to change her life. You know the story. But she says, let's talk about religion. Okay, you guys say Jerusalem is the only place really to worship God appropriately. That's why you guys come walking through our land several times a year, going to Jerusalem or coming home from the feast because you're going there to worship. And our people say that up here is the place to worship. Well, which one is it? And Jesus says, believe me, I love this. Dear woman, I love the way the New Living Translation puts it. Dear woman, using the same phrase that he'll use when he speaks to his mother. Dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter where you worship the Father, on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of getting close to the heart here. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. One translation says, you, you Samaritans don't even know what you worship. You don't even know what you're doing in worship. You just didn't want to worship the way we worship, so you tweaked it a little bit. He said, and that's exactly what they did. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. And there he is standing in front of her. The one that brings salvation has walked all the way to her village, and he's standing at her well. This thirsty, empty-hearted woman who's looking for love. We know all about him. Salvation comes through him. But the time is coming, indeed, it is, it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father is looking for those who will worship him in that way. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Wow. Got a whole lot more than a bucket full of water that day, didn't she? She got a download of truth on worship. Worship has nothing to do with where you sit on a Sunday morning. I, and I've said this many times. I'll say it very briefly. The definition of worship in the Bible has nothing whatsoever to do with music. That's what the Bible calls praise. And that's a high and holy exercise that we get to do. To lift up our voices, lift up our hands, and lift up our heart to God. And he loves it when we praise him with that kind of a heart. Worship is found more foundational than what we do with our lips and with our fingers while we play our guitars and our keyboards and, and whatever we play. It has to do, and I'll make this very, 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 very easy. The first mention of worship in the Bible is back in, Je in Genesis chapter 22 when, when Abraham, who's on his way to sacrifice his son, he comes to the bottom of the hill and he says to the two servants, you guys stay here. This is for my son and I only. My boy and I will go into the mountain and we will worship. And then we will return. They were not going up there to sing songs. Abraham didn't turn to Isaac and say, Hey buddy, I, I left my guitar on the donkey. Would you go grab my guitar and don't forget the song sheets? We're going to go and worship. You know what that was that they were doing? Painful obedience to God. Just as painful for father as it was for son. The thought of doing that. And by the way, God had said, as, as I read it, God had said, offer him to me as a burnt offering. That can be taken one of two ways. He wasn't saying, go kill him. That's how he took it. And he was ready to obey to that level. But he was saying, I want you to offer your son to me just like you would offer a living sacrifice. Give him to me holy. Maybe God... Maybe, maybe the gift of God and his son had become, had taken the place of, of the true worship of God in his heart, but whatever it was. But Jesus says, you know, you guys are so confused on worship, but you must worship God in spirit and the truth. It's not this temple or that synagogue. It's where your heart is with God, surrendered to him. And the woman said, oh, I know that Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. And when he comes, he'll explain all of this to us. And what, in other words, she's saying, what, he's going to straighten you guys out and he'll straighten us guys out too. Because in, in, in the Jewish community and their worship, it had gotten a little bit tweaked as well. He says, when Messiah comes, he's going to straighten everything out. And then Jesus said to her, can you imagine this? I am the Messiah. 
I who speak to you am he. Wow. That, that Samaritan woman got the gift of all gifts that day. She met the Messiah and just then his disciples came back. And they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. That's why he'd sent them away. They, ooh, what did I knock down? Oh, I'm so sorry, Scott. I think I broke it. No, I didn't. They were shocked that he's talking to a woman. And, and reading on. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? And the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man. This is incredible. Come and see a man who told me I've had five husbands and the one I'm living with now, it doesn't put it, she doesn't put it that way. Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Really? That's all you've done? You know what she's saying? All her life, what had she been looking for? Anybody? Love. She'd looked for love all her life, and she'd struck out. Well, if it was, it was striking out, she's basically on her, third, her second out. She struck out three times, one, two, three, then two more, and the one she's with now, she shouldn't even be with. She has struck out two times. And she said, he's told me everything I have ever done could he possibly be the Messiah? I don't know what you've done your whole life. I don't know what you think you've been looking for your whole life. But I'll tell you what it comes down to. What you've been looking for your whole life to fill the emptiness, to fill the hurt, to fill the ache, to heal the brokenness. Whatever you thought it was, if it wasn't Jesus, it'll never work. He's the one. He's the only one. He said, could he possibly be the Messiah? And so the people came streaming from the village to see him. You know what she became? The very first cross-cultural missionary in the Bible. And I don't even know if she's really in her heart re received him. I, I, I don't know if there's more steps that she needs to take. But she's ready to tell other people about the one who knew the deepest secrets. She knew He knew the things that she was ashamed of. He, he knew every broken fiber of her heart and her life. And he'd come for her. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. And meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something, eat something. They brought the food. And I love what Jesus said here. He said, oh, I have the kind of food you know nothing about. Yeah, I have the kind of food you know nothing about. And then they said, did someone bring him food while we were gone? And then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Oh, man. Well, I could go on in the story, but I kind of need to stop right there. But there, there's a point there, too, that there is something so satisfying about doing the thing that God called you to do, isn't there? And there's something that just, it's like it, it reaches down to that place in, in your soul. Even, even you, you come to the place where, and I've been at this place not very often. I mean, I can always eat. Anybody else with me? I can always find room for, for a, another veggie burger because I can't eat the burgers anymore. And I can't drink coffee anymore. I can't drink decaf anymore. All kinds of stuff. But, oh, I can always find something and find room for something. But there is something so satisfying at the end of the day, when you knew that God used you to bring encouragement to somebody, hope or love or healing to somebody, it just is enough, isn't it? Isn't it? It's enough. So Jesus, this day, when he had to go through this place, and he had to stop because that one woman that was there, it was all for the glory of God. And he comes to the end of that day, and he is satisfied. And he says to his disciples, I don't need the falafel. Thanks so much. A falafel that you are going to have to eat my falafel for me, but you're going to have to do it because I'm just, I'm just not hungry. He was full. And so it's such a beautiful thing to be used by God to touch somebody in, in his name. And I know that many of you know exactly what that's like. Jesus deliberately moved himself to a place. When he, how, was he, how was he feeling at the beginning of the story? tired. What else? 
thirsty. What else? Right on target. When he saw her walking up to the well, he said, that's her. That's her. I believe Jesus, every morning as he spent time with the Father, the reason he did that is so he could get his assignments for the day, his, his bullet list for the day. And he was right on target that day as he sat down by that well. He deliberately, deliberately sought her out. And for some of you tonight, he's deliberately sought you out this very night. Jesus sees her in a different way than anybody else saw her. And tonight, I need to tell you, all of these are going to convey to you. He sees you. He knows all the details about you. Jesus stops for her. He stopped for you. He's not here just for a multitude of people or a half a multitude, whatever this number is here tonight. Jesus loved her as he spoke truth to her. And Jesus loves you, knowing all about you. All the details, and I mean everything about you. He knows everything about you, the things that you will never tell anybody. He knows that stuff, and he loves you. He's he's your perfect love. I remember years and years ago, it has to be 24 years ago probably, I was teaching the Gospel of John down at the Bible College in Murrieta. And I was teaching this this, uh, passage, and I love this story. And as I'm wrapping up, this one young lady, she raises her hand, kind of a shy young lady, as I remember. She raises her hand, the meekest voice, and she said, Pastor Bill, I was just doing the math on this, and there were five husbands that she had. Now the one that she's living with is number six, and yet Jesus, is he the number seven for her? Is he like the perfect love for her? Because doesn't isn't seven the number of perfection in the Bible? And I just thought, whoo, class over. I got nothing better than that. He's the perfect number seven for you. All other loves that came before mean they, they don't measure up to him. This is the love. Jesus is the love that you've been looking for all your life. And if you're one of those here tonight that has never said yes to Jesus, tonight is your night to do that. Jesus offered her that same living water that he's offering you tonight so that that deepest thirst in in your soul will be quenched. And I don't care if you're seven or you're 77 tonight. And we're not going to stop at 77 because someone here is 103, probably. But it's not too late for you to say, Jesus, I'm still thirsty. I'm still parched. And I need your love and I need your forgiveness. Forgiveness. Jesus offers you that same living water and he's ready to quench your thirst right now like he quenched her thirst that day. Just like he said, if you drink this, oh, it's going to become a flood that's going to come out of you to other people. But first, take a good long drink. This despised, condemned, outcast, spiritually confused, passed around the town woman becomes that first missionary back to her own town. Oh, I'd love to hang out in Sychar for a month or two after this and just see what happens there. Matthew chapter 12 um, has a verse that comes straight out of Isaiah 42. And I want to read that to you. Isaiah 42. Listen to this. Because it so speaks to the, the, the ministry of Jesus that day. Who did, he, who did Jesus go into the world looking for? Who did he come for? Who did he go far out of his way to other villages like Sychar and to the, the village of Nain and Cana and Capernaum and Bethsaida? And go across the Sea of Galilee the last two Wednesday nights. We've looked at the storm that was sent to try to keep Jesus from the demoniac that was in that cemetery. He goes way out of his way. It says this, look at my servant. This is the prophecy of Isaiah. God speaking, look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed. Little little reed by the river. He won't snap it or crush it. It's meaningful to him. I I love this next part. He won't put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. 
He's not here to crush you. He's not here to snuff out that last little bit of light that is in you. He's here to not fan that light, to put a new light in you, to give you tonight beauty from ashes. But you've got to do something. You've got to bring your bruised reed to him. You have to bring that flickering candle of your heart to him. Or maybe it has been snuffed out. There's no light there. You need to bring your busted shell to him. You got that, you got that shell? Hold up the shell that you got. You, get, you still got it there? I love these things. Did, did I say this earlier? When I started collecting the shells that ended up on the cross, it was July of 19, or not 19, July of 2020, when I started walking down at the beach and picking up nice shells, full shells, beautiful shells. Even found a half of an abalone down there one day. Big, beautiful shells that something had lived in. Actually, I got a couple of them home and something was still living in it when I got it home. I won't tell you what happened after that. But I noticed one day that the most common shell on the beach is a broken shell. And I've told that to you before. And it just immediately, God uses things like this to speak to my heart. He said, Bill, all I've ever done all I, all I was doing when I sent my son is to walk along the shores of this world and to pick up broken heart after broken heart after broken heart. Broken shell of a human being and to bring restoration. I almost always carry one of these in my pocket. It's in my hand many times during the day reminding me that Jesus picked up the broken shell of my life. And he's come tonight for the broken shell of your life too, if you will give it to him. He's come to forgive your sin and to overwhelm your failure with more than success, but with solidness and, and with hope and no more excuses. The only reasonable thing to do is to bring what's left of your broken life to Jesus and make him tonight your, would you read the word up there on the, on the sign with me? To make him your what? Your refuge is the only worthy refuge for a broken soul. Make, make that statement tonight by saying, Jesus, I'm bringing my broken life to you with that broken shell in your hand as a token of that. And I want to pray right now as the band comes back up. And I want to give you an invitation to, to make a declaration of your faith in Jesus Christ tonight. And maybe you're coming to him for the first time. Maybe you're saying to Jesus, I'm bringing this broken area of my life to you tonight. Just like that broken woman finally surrendered to you and, and said yes to you. I am saying yes to you. Maybe I'm saying yes to you again. I'm going to ask you in a moment to stand up and make a standing declaration that I am tonight a man. And I'm joining you. I'm already standing, but I'm standing up again in my heart as we pray. I'm saying, God, tonight I'm bringing this area of brokenness and this area of need in my life to you because I need the fresh work of your spirit. I need that flow of that river of living water in me. God, I want you to take me deeper and take me further and do a deeper work in my heart. So anybody tonight that would say, God, I'm bringing this, my, either my whole life to you, I'm surrendering to you as my Lord and Savior. I've kept you out of my life for a long time, but tonight I'm inviting you in. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to stand. If, if you as a believer are saying, I'm bringing another area of my life, maybe it's hope, maybe it's addiction, maybe it's depression, maybe it's discouragement, and you're going to give that relationship, that particular thing to Jesus, I want to ask you to stand as well with me right now going to pray together and if you need prayer after the service too back there in the back corner uh, there's a, 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 a prayer tent and go to the they would love to, to pray with you even further tonight and maybe the Christians you came with so let's hold these things in our hand just as a token this, this, this is not like a rosary okay this is just a token that represents our brokenness and let's say to him Father God let's pray out loud with me Father God I thank you for Jesus Christ who came to this world to save broken people like me, to forgive guilty people like me, to restore hope to people like me. And I'm asking you for that tonight, Lord. I believe he died on that cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. As I stand before you tonight, Lord, this sinner needs a Savior. 
And so I thank you that you are that Savior. You are that healer. You are that restorer of hope. So fill my life again with your Spirit and light the fire deep in my soul. The rest of my life is yours. In Jesus' name. Because we're all that way, aren't we? We've tried so many times this thing or that thing, and it left us just as empty as it did last time. So we're going to sing. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how much more, but whatever time is left, I, can I just encourage you? Sing strong to the Lord. Praise Him well tonight because of the amazing God that He is. Are you thankful? Do you love Him? Keep loving Him. Did you get a drink tonight? Then let that drink become a river because other people are thirsty around you. No need to hurry off tonight because we need your help to break all this stuff down too. But people around you need hope. So take some time to bless each other and love each other. And, and don't forget to check out the K-Wave booth. By the way, they're about to more than double their broadcast area uh, to way up all the way to, I think, like Ventura. So go get some information about K-Wave. Those are amazing guys in that tent right there. That's Mark and Zach. I remembered both names. Bless those guys and check out the other vendors to love one another. God bless you. If you want to stand with us, we would love that. Just honor the Lord as we sing this last song. Sing this together. You give life. You give life. You are love. And you bring light to the darkness. You give hope. Restore every heart that is broken. We sing, Great are you, Lord. You give life, give life. You are love, and you bring light to the dark. Thine is broken. So we sing, Great are you, Lord. It's your breath, it's your breath, and in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath.
absolutely love to pray with you. Um, if you have a spare minute and would like to help us break down um, what's going on out here, the easy ups and the black tables and chairs would be a great place to start. And lastly, your kids, they're ready for you. <laughs> so please go ahead and make your way to pick up your kids. Y'all have a great night. Drive safe. We'll see you next time. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.